Warning. The following reading contains subject matter that some listeners might find disturbing. Listener discretion is advised. A bat foot across the face of a monstrous harvest moon, its leathery wings sweeping through the chill autumn mist, leaving swirls and spirals in its wake. The creature of the night flew back and forth eating the last bugs of the season. Fat as it was, the bat would need every scrap of weight it could put on before the harsh winter months. Already a few of its fellows had secluded themselves in caves and hollow trees, snug and plump, lost in half-sleep that would last until spring. A moth stirred up from its grass, its gossamer wings, making it a pale ghost in the moonlight. A quick snap of tiny jaws and the mouthful was gobbled down. With a surge of its wings, the bat flew on into the night. As it neared a barn blazing with light, the creature became somewhat curious. Usually at this time of night, the barn would be empty, dark and inviting for one of its kind. Instead, the bat could hear sounds of ponies busily at work inside. It would have flown closer for a better look, but a sudden chill ran down its spine making it think twice, an instinct that even it barely understood screamed louder and clearer in the bat's tiny head. Danger! Best to move on and find more prey. Best to find a safe spot and sleep in the deep, dreamless sleep of hibernation. Best to go far, far from here to do it. There is nothing here for a tiny bat. Nothing but death. Apple Bloom! called Applejack, putting the last batch of caramel apples on a tray lined with waxed paper to cool. Benches set up in the barn lined the walls, half filled with the sugar-coated fruit. Where has that filly gone off to? She muttered to herself. A cauldron, half empty but for a hissing puddle of sweet brown syrup, cooled over a pile of smoldering coals just outside the barn door. The barn itself was warm and snug, filled with lantern light and sweet scent of sugary treats, quite the contrast to the chilled night outside. Even so, Applejack couldn't help drawing the cool air into her lungs with a satisfied smile as she stepped out to look for her sister. She loved this time of year. Winter would be here soon enough, it was true, and that had its own work and worry, just like spring and summer. But the autumn months, after harvest, were a time of relaxation and fun for the Apple family. With the crops in, safe and sound, money would be rolling in to Sweet Apple Acres before too long. It was a tradition in their family to share the wealth, and what better way than to provide all kinds of apple-themed treats and games for kitties at Nightmare Night. Nightmare Night, it was the first holiday to come after the harvest, so the Apple family always did it big. Of course, the holiday had always been more about treats than tricks at Sweet Apple Acres, Every year, Granny Smith would have tubs set up in Ponyville for the townsfolk to bob for apples. She had taken to turning in early and letting Applejack make sure that they stay full and crisp, delicious apples. Even so, Granny Smith was still an important part of the festival. Every year since Big Mac was old enough to pull a plow, he'd offer hay rides for the community as well. Even Apple Bloom seemed to be taking more of an interest in the festivities. Last year, she'd gone around with Pinkie Pie collecting candy with her friends, but this year, she seemed to be really interested in helping Applejack make up a few homemade treats to pass out at the festival in town. A few of the recipes Apple Bloom was trying out seemed a mite odd, but Applejack didn't mind trying new things so long as they were able to finish making their batch of usual treats as well. The only problem was, after helping Applejack spare a few apples and dip them in the bubbling caramel, Apple Bloom seemed to quickly lost interest and wandered off to do her own thing. Really, Applejack shouldn't have been surprised. Apple Bloom had a habit of getting distracted by the least little thing. They should have been done making treats hours ago, but as it was, she still had about half the apples left to dip. Worse, she was running low on caramel and firewood. Apple Bloom! Called Applejack again as she went to the side of the barn where the wood pile was kept to get a few fresh sticks. Wherever you run off to, get your flank back here, missy! We got a lot of apples to dip before we store them in the barn to dry, and we're gonna burn through the midnight oil with all your diddly daddling. The country pony paused and listened. The fog that curled through the orchard tonight did strain things to the familiar sounds of the farm, muffling noises that Applejack would normally find comforting and amplifying those she couldn't identify. She didn't hear the sounds of tiny hoofs coming her way, nor did she hear her little sister's voice calling out in response. What she thought she heard was 
giggling. High and girlish giggling. Just on the edge of her hearing. It wasn't something any pony wanted to hear all alone on a dark night. Easy, girl. You're just spooking yourself. Applejack reassured herself under her breath as she quickly piled a few dry branches on her back for the fire. She really wished that Granny Smith didn't go to sleep so early and that Big Macintosh wasn't off in town helping set up for tomorrow's celebration. More than anything, she wished Apple Bloom would stop wandering off on her own. A farm was no place for a young filly to go exploring by herself, especially at night. Applejack had heard too many horror stories of colts playing around on farm equipment and hurting themselves. Perhaps more dreadful were the stories of fillies falling into old sinkholes or boarded up wells and no pony finding them until months later, if they found them at all. A thought suddenly occurred to Applejack as she headed back towards the front of the barn. Apple Bloom, you better not be playing a trick on me. It ain't nightmare night just yet. When there was no answer, she tried. I'll tell Big Macintosh on you. There was still no answer. At least, no answer she wanted to acknowledge as being more than a figment of her imagination. As she rounded the side of the barn, a sudden burst of flame whooshed into life, painting the fog bright orange. Applejack jumped back, the firewood she carried on her back scattering at her hooves. She almost bolted there and then, but calmed down when she realized the flames were under the cauldron. Some pony had gotten the fire going again while she'd been back at the woodpile. Had Apple Bloom gone to fetch more wood and she missed her going around the other side of the barn? As Applejack grew closer, she saw whomever had built up the fire had used too much fuel. The flames were licking up the side of the culture and bright and hungry. Already she could see that the caramel that had been left in the pot was bubbling up. At this rate, it would burn and blacken, going completely to waste. Oh, Apple Bloom, sweetie, you can't use this much wood. You need a low heat for this kind of treat. She went to drag the cauldron out of the fire and save what she could of the caramel, careful to avoid the leaping and flickering flames, but found the old pot wouldn't budge. It was usually only this heavy when it was full, not half empty like it was. Applejack did the best she could, tugging on the cauldron inch by inch away from the bar. But once it was on a patch of damp dirt, she went about kicking sand over what flames she could, trying to tame the wildfire. The flames subdued a bit, so Applejack decided she'd try to get her sister's help to get the cauldron back in place. Apple Bloom, you in here? Asked Applejack as she cantered into the barn. The lanterns had been blown out. By the light from the fire, Applejack could tell the barn was empty on the inside. Empty, that is, save for a pile of sticky popsicle sticks that used to have caramel apples on the end, sitting boldly on the benches. Even the apples that hadn't even been dipped yet were missing. A tiny voice. Hungry. <laughs> so that's what was going on. Apple Bloom, I can't believe you. These treats were for tomorrow to share with all the fillies and colts who came looking for sweets to bite. How could you and your friends be so selfish to eat them all before they even had a chance to dry? Sweetie Belle and Scootaloo had to be in on this. Sweet Apple Acres produce might be good enough that a filly would like to try to eat a whole bushel in one go, but one filly couldn't have eaten all the apples Applejack had dipped. Even three managing it was a stretch, but that was the only logical conclusion she could come to. Apple Bloom, you get out here young Missy, you and your friends, or I swear I'll be writing a letter to Celestia about how I learned to break filly's rumps with my bare hooves. Still, there was nothing but silence. Al almost. There was that high, girlish <laughs> giggling again. It sounded like... It sounded like it was coming from the cauldron, but... That couldn't be right. It didn't make any sense. How could the girls be hiding in that bubbling hot mess? Applejack moved tentatively towards the cauldron, her eyes darting back and forth. Beyond the glow of the fire, there was nothing but darkness, mist, and fading moonlight. The smoke of partially quenched fire burned her eyes as she looked into the big black pot, ready to jump back at the first sign of a trick. She froze, her eyes locked on the sad, shriveled-up figure curled into a ball at the bottom of the pot. She was completely covered in bubbling brown sugar, but even so... Applejack could tell right away the tiny figure was her sister. Apple Bloom! She screamed. Applejack reached into the cauldron with her bare hooves, spurning her limbs on the still hot metal as she closed them around Apple Bloom's unmoving form. 
the pain of her shearing flesh nothing compared to the agony that tore at her heart. How had this happened? Had her sister somehow fallen in? Why hadn't she cried out? Why hadn't she screamed? Applejack ran into the barn where there was a trough of water and quickly dunked Apple Bloom's body into the cold liquid. The caramel was already starting to set. The sticky gunk wouldn't come off. Applejack did the best she could, but a part of her knew that it was already too late. Her sister wasn't breathing. She tried hammering on her tiny chest, put a mouth to her sister's and breathed air into her lungs. It did nothing but leave a sickly sweet taste in her mouth, pieces of half-dried caramel sticking to her lips. That was too much for her. She fell back on her haunches, wiping her mouth with her hoof, trying to get rid of the taste. The taste of death and candy. She felt her gorge rise as tears pricked in the corners of her eyes. How could this have happened? She blamed herself. What kind of horrible sister was she? That's when she heard the laughter again. It filled the barn, vibrating through the straw, and the plank and seemed to echo inside her chest, inside her head. There were words, too, in a childish sing-song voice. Nightmare night, what a fright. Applejack got up, backed away, wildly turning her head back and forth, trying to find the source of the song and the horrible, mocking laughter. Where are you? Who are you? Did you do this? Did you do this to Apple Bloom? What did my sister ever do to deserve this? Applejack howled, tears of anger and sadness spilling from her eyes. She backed slowly out of the barn, her sister's body, turning around and around. Where was the laughter coming from? She stumbled out into the cool night air, still reeling from what happened to her sister, still haunted by the laughter of children she couldn't see. If she had watched where she was going, she might not have tripped over the well-placed hook. She didn't realize she had stumbled into the fire until the flames were chasing themselves through her tail and flickering up into her mane. Panicked beyond all reason, she reared back on her hind legs and fell right into the still cooling cauldron. She screamed then, loud enough to wake the dead, as her flesh burst and blistered from the heat and the sticky caramel seeped into her wounds. Everywhere the metal of the pot touched, a layer of her skin stuck, sizzling and smoking as it parted from the rest of her body. Blinded by the smoke of her own burning flesh, the stench choking her even as she fought for more air which to scream. She tried desperately to climb out of the cauldron. The sides, slick with her own blood, slipped beneath her painful fumbling. The giggling rose all around her, the laughter loud and menacing. A face peered out of the smoke. It was huge, its eyes pinned in of madness, its teeth sharp and pointed. Give us something sweet to bite, sang gleefully as it lunged forward. Applejack felt those sharp teeth close around half of her face. One eye went dark as it popped between a pair of sharp fangs. Her shriek faded to a gurgle as the monster ripped away part of her face and throat, chewed and then swallowed the bloody wad of flesh. With a burst of adrenaline, Applejack managed to scamper out of the cauldron and crumble to the earth. She felt something crack as she hit the dirt. But it didn't matter. She just had to run. She had to get away. She couldn't get up properly, but still she dragged herself through the dirt. A mad idea seized her. If she could get to the barn, just get to the barn and close the door, she could buy herself some time to think. Just think. Tears spilling from her one remaining eye, she labored over the earth. The few feet between the fire and possible safety now seeming miles any moment she expected the monster's teeth to find her again. With mild disbelief, Applejack tumbled into the barn and slammed the door behind her. She panted heavily, finding it hard to suck air into lungs while there was a hole in her throat. She started coughing uncontrollably, suffocating on her own blood and terror. Something slammed into the door behind her like a freight train, making her shriek and whimper. The wood splintered as laughter shook the front of the entire barn. She stood on her hind legs with her back to the barn door, bracing her burnt and melted limbs against the door and the slippery straw-covered floor as best she could. This couldn't be happening. She couldn't handle something like this on her own. She needed help. She needed help right now. As she opened her mouth to scream again, this time to yell as loud as she could for help. She felt 
felt something suddenly burst between her jaws. It happened as if it was in slow motion. The wooden door blossomed, opening like a rare red flower, all spines and petals gaping wide as if to entice a lover. Shards and shrapnel shred open Applejack's back, sending a shower of scarlet spurting from her that splashed across the barn door in a pattern that looked almost like wings. She never had time to register the pain as the thing that caused the hole, something large and cylindrical, was forced clean through her back and up through her ribcage and into her mouth from her throat. She couldn't tell what it was at first, but the taste of dirt on the fence post mixed with her own blood as the sharp end skewered her tongue. She felt her teeth break and her jaw pop loose from the rest of her skull as with another forceful shove, the post shattered the door behind her and the creature began to force its own body through. She felt parts of her she had never felt before burst within her body as the thick shaft of the wood churned her internal organs to mush. The monster, whatever it was, tore through the barn door like it was tissue paper, a look of triumph on what she could see of its twisted face. She didn't even feel the shards of wood embedded in her back anymore, only the wood that had impaled her. It was almost a relief when her burning lung collapsed, and the rhythm of her heart slowed, stuttering its final beats. The last thing that flickered across her consciousness before she finally died was a figure raising her into the air, <laughs> smiling, giggling all the while, and taking another bite of the caramel coated applejack. Why is it so cold, Mummy? It's been cold like this for the last few years, dear Art. You know that. Those Pegasi have been trying to freeze us out thinking we'd give them more food if they made it hard for us. But we'll show them the earth ponies are made of sterner stuff. The Pegasi? Are you hopping on about that again, sweetie? Who else, dear? You said yourself that when you're out playing the field with my brother that you've seen them darting about in the clouds above. Oh, I tried to figure out what those high and mighty unicorns have done to make it snow and cold all the time. You mark my words. Those Pegasi are as stumped as us about all this. It's magic that's in those clouds, and magic what's bringing this unnatural cold upon us. Could, could the unicorns make them go away, Daddy? Could they make it stop being so cold? They can do anything, love. Anything at all, them. Why, just a fortnight ago when I and your uncle went to deliver our tid, I seen one of them bouncy unicorns taking some of our produce and putting it into a box of his. Powered by magic it was. One end went in strawberries, the other end out popped the strange creamy concoction that was as cold as any snowdrift. Ah, oh, you and your tails. You'll be giving her ideas about those horn heads are all powerful next. Their hooves are in the dirt as much as ours, but they act like they're even higher in the clouds than the Pegasi. Not so different from us earth ponies, that lot. But we always have to be putting on airs. We don't need you spreading their propaganda for them. But it's true! He said he ran something called a sweets shop. Told me to stop being with my daughter next time I was in town and he'd give her a treat. Next time you're in town? Do you mean the city, Daddy? The castle? Oh, I've never been! You know how much I've always wanted to go, Daddy? To see the High Lords and Ladies. Yes, well, your dar and I will have to have a talk about that. You get on with your chores. Step lively. Brisk work of the limbs will do wonders to keep the chill out of your bones. It was a bright, autumnal day, about a week before Nightmare Night would begin. The breeze was crisp and sent leaves dancing and tumbling playfully in the streets, even as the sun still shone merrily. Though it was sad to see summer end, the ponies of Equestria knew the necessity of all four seasons, so most of the town of Ponyville walked with a spring in their step, despite the chill that hung in the air. None were perhaps as chipper as Pinkie Pie, though, the self-proclaimed friend of every pony. The pink mare was a ball of energy as she went about putting up the decorations for the coming Nightmare Night celebrations. There was so much to do. Even with help, she had to start a week in advance to get it all done in time. 
This was no chore for Pinky, though. She loved decorating like this and watching the town transform before her eyes from its usual quaint self to one just a little bit scary, but fun. Since it was afternoon and school had let out, a few of the town's children were helping her spread fake spider webbing around the post office. They had to clear away a few very real cobwebs before they started. Not many ponies visited the post office themselves these days. Ugh, this is a waste of time. I don't know why Daddy insists we help with these decorations when no pony is ever going to see them, moaned Diamond Tiara. The only ponies that bother with the post office are practically Nightmare Night decorations themselves. The pampered filly sneered at a pair of nearsighted elderly ponies who were busy trying to figure out how many bits it would cost to send a package to Baltimore. Totally! Agreed Silver Spoon, as usual. It's a waste of time when their eyesight is so bad they can't even actually see the decorations anyway. Silver Spoon turned her nose up and walked over to the box of decorations, inspecting them. Besides, if they did, it might give them a heart attack, she said with fake concern. We should really move on somewhere more interesting, like the mall or the bowling alley. At least then we could do a little shopping or have some fun. After we finish decorating, of course. She feigned a look of innocence, knowing from experience that her silver tongue and good looks were the key to getting her way. Now, girls, the mayor has entrusted us to decorate the whole entire town! exclaimed Pinky, spreading her hooves in the air as if to encompass all of Ponyville. It wouldn't be the whole town if we only hung spiderwebs and pumpkin lights in storefronts and shopping malls! Pinkie Pie bubbled as she went about festooning the quiet post office with black and purple streamers. Besides, it's way more fun to transform an old, boring post office into someplace exciting than it would be to make an already interesting place more exciting. She smiled awkwardly as the postmaster gave her a look from behind the counter. <laughs> no offense. Just then, Apple Bloom, Sweetie Belle, and Scootaloo tumbled in front of Pinkie Pie all at once. They were supposed to be spreading the webbing in the rafters, but had somehow managed to get themselves hopelessly tangled up with one another. Silver Spoon and Diamond Tiara led the other children in laughter at their misfortune. It didn't take Pinky long to extract the trio of friends, though she almost got herself just as badly tangled in the process. What happened? I'm sorry, Pinkie Pie. It was all my fault. Me and my friends got to talking about all the candy we was gonna get come nightmare night, and I must have gotten a little distracted. Apple Bloom grinned sheepishly. Yeah! Chimed in Scootaloo. We had a ball last year going around with you and collecting candy. Even after we left half of it for Nightmare Moon, we still had plenty to share, added Sweetie Belle cheerfully. And I'm sure we'll have lots again this year, even after we leave our tribute. Ugh, leave it to you blank blanks to still be giving up your candy to Nightmare Moon. Every pony knows it's just Celestia's sister. She's not going to gobble you up if you don't give her some of your candy. Diamond Tiara exclaimed, rolling her eyes. We kept all our candy last year, added Silver Spoon. As you can see, we're doing just fine. It was truly amazing, too. You know the neighborhood where I live? They give out full-size candy bars by the hopeful. We were still eating Nightmare Night candy at arms warming. The spoiled fillies smiled, drinking their peers' jealousy, both real and imagined. But I'm sure it won't matter if you do decide to leave a few fun-sized treats in the dirt," grinned Diamond Tiara in a predatory fashion. So the big bad princess won't gobble you up! At that, the pair <laughs> laughed uproariously. <laughs> Apple Bloom and her friends just looked at each other. Sometimes Diamond Tiara and Silver Spoon's sense of humor just didn't seem all that funny. Even so, Apple Bloom wasn't one to back down from a challenge. Well, we ain't gonna leave any of our candy then either! In fact, I bet we can collect more candy than you two, even with your fancy full-size candy bars," said the fiery-haired filly. Oh, really? Care to make a bet then? Whoever has the most candy wins. Let's say the losers have to give up all their candy," said Silver Spoon, a grin playing at the corner of her mouth. You're on!" cried Scootaloo. Now hold on, girls! You can't go crazy hoarding candy like that! Leaving an offering for Nightmare Moon is an important Nightmare Night tradition!" said Pinkie Pie. I mean, sure, it's tempting to hold
hold on to all those gummy bears and candy apples and candy bars and, and pixie sticks and lollipops and gumdrops and what were we talking about? The pink pony fanned herself with a rubber bat, clearly flustered. Oh, <laughs> right. But you couldn't really keep them all for yourself. That's not what Nightmare Night is all about. Right? I guess you're right, Pinkie Pie, said Sweetie Belle, looking down sadly at her hoofs. Backing out of our wager already, then, asked Diamond Tiara with a snide look on her face. I guess it would be difficult for you Blank Flanks to compete with us if you're going to fall for all this tradition nonsense. Looks like we win by default. We'll expect your candy at the end of Nightmare Night. Don't go throwing too much of it away at the foot of some statue in the woods now. Now hold on! cried Apple Bloom. We ain't gonna be throwing away any candy, and we ain't gonna be welching on no bet. You have your candy ready to fork over to us by the end of Nightmare Night, and may the best belly win. Um, maybe we should move on, girls, tried Pinkie Pie, a little nervous at how serious things had gotten between the young friends. Who wants to help me decorate the library? exclaimed Twilight, Sparkle, and Bafflement. What are you doing? A gaggling of fillies and colts had invaded Twilight Sparkle's home and were clambering clumsily over her neatly arranged shelves. She and Spike had worked the better part of the afternoon taking the autumn audit of what books were checked out and what books were checked in, and what books were in need of repair before they could be returned to the shelves. Now, entire stacks of books were slipping, sliding, and plain being knocked over by careless little hooves. And in the middle of it all, Pinkie Pie stood cheerfully, half covered in fake spiderwebs and streamers. Oh, hey Twilight, said the pink pony, clearly delighted to see her friend. In the background, snips and snails tripped over one another in their efforts to hang bat-winged streamers along the stairs leading up to Twilight's room. They landed in a clumsily laughing heap that nearly toppled an entire shelf of books. I was hoping you'd be home soon, said Pinkie Pie. Mayor Mayor is having me decorate all the public buildings in Ponyville this year for Nightmare Night. But it wouldn't be half as much fun getting the library ready if I didn't have your input as well. Pinkie Pie draped a forelimb over Twilight's shoulder and guided her through the barely controlled chaos of laughing and shouting children. I was thinking bats. Bats everywhere. Hanging from the ceiling and the stairs. Something to really catch every pony's eye when they walk in. Twilight couldn't help being distracted as fillies ran back and forth, some trailing decorations in their wake, while others just seemed to be playing some kind of game. But Pinky, this is my home! We didn't decorate the library last year inside or out! I know! And I got to thinking that was a real shame! It's unfair that folks can only enjoy the fun of Nightmare Night downtown or in the big shops, and not in other places like boring post offices and libraries! Twilight glared at her friend. No offense. I just wanted to make sure that no matter where a pony goes in Ponyville, that the spirit of Nightmare Night will be with them. You know? Twilight stared into Pinkie Pie's sincere, grinning face. For all the bedlam, it was tough to face that hopeful, well-meaning smile and not cave just a little. I guess, Pinkie Pie, if the mirror approves. The party pony gave a happy little leap, pounding one hoof in the air before Twilight quickly added. But please don't go overboard, and do your work quietly. This is still a library, and other ponies have the right to expect peace and quiet when they come here. Pinkie Pie gave a little salute, and seemed as though she was about to say something in reply when a loud crash came from the back of the room. With all the close calls, it was a matter of time before an entire shelf of books would be knocked to the floor. Far from any pony being hurt, however, the perpetrators were shouting at one another amid the wreckage of scattered books. Diamond Tiara and Apple Bloom's animated argument threatened to damage the books further as each filly seemed to be stomping mad. Will not! Will so! Will not! Will so! Girls! Girls! What's all this about? cried Twilight, using her magic to separate the fillies. She started it! She keeps saying we're gonna chicken out, but I don't want to stand for her talking about us that way, cried a very agitated Apple Bloom. Oh, please, Apple Blank, sneered Diamond Tiara. Like there's anything you can do about it. Twilight settled the pair back to the floor, but still held them back from each other. 
Twilight turned to Pinkie Pie as she struggled to keep the fillies from hurting themselves or any pony else. What in Equestria are they talking about? She demanded. Oh, you know how kids are, mumbled the pink pony, smiling nervously. We kind of have a bet going about who can collect the most candy, Pinkie quickly added to the fillies. But they're just going to have to collect that much more after they leave some for Nightmare Moon. Right, girls? F F, replied Silver Spoon flippantly, standing with her nose in the air next to her friend. No way! retorted Scootaloo, jumping in the air and fluttering her little wings in irritation. Believing a tithe of candy for Nightmare Moon is one of the oldest traditions of Nightmare Night, said Twilight Sparkle, shocked. No bet could be worth breaking from tradition like that. I mean, remember last year? Wasn't it fun to leave a little candy so Nightmare Moon wouldn't get you? Jeez, listen to her, said Diamond Tiara dismissively, sharing a glance with Silver Spoon. You'd think she was just some common pony and not Celestia's student. Did you leave candy for your teacher's sister? Well, no, admitted Twilight. However, I did when I was younger. Every nightmare night, my brother and I would leave a little pile next to the statue in Canterlot. Though that was just a statue of Luna, not really Nightmare Moon. Celestia didn't seem to like the image of her sister as a monster. I remember when... Twilight's eyes grew misty with memory, but Silver Spoon sighed heavily, interrupting her. I'm sure you have many wonderful memories of the good old days, but do you really think Luna's going to get any pony that doesn't leave her candy? She didn't get you after all. She pointed out disdainfully. <laughs> well, of course not, silly. Twilight isn't a filly. <laughs> laughed Pinkie Pie, trying to defuse the situation. Twilight, for her part, however, seemed to grow thoughtful. No, oh, I guess she's right, Pinkie Pie. There's no point in lying. Princess Luna may be a little strange, but she's not dangerous. Nightmare Night is fun pretend, but honestly, I don't see any harm from them not giving up a bit of their candy, even if it is against tradition. Pinkie Pie seemed genuinely shocked by her friend's words. Don't listen to her, girls, said Pinky urgently. We have these traditions for a reason. The decorations, the costumes, the jack-o'-lanterns, the offerings to Nightmare Moon. They were all started to protect us. There's no good reason to turn your back on all of that now. Not so close to Nightmare Night. The usual jovial pony pleaded, her deep blue eyes wide with worry. The girls in Twilight gave Pinky a funny look, not really understanding what all the fuss was about. Here, I'll show you. I know it's around here somewhere. Pinkie Pie started rummaging through the fallen books. It always amazed Twilight that regardless of how disorganized the library might become, Pinkie Pie could always turn up just the book she was looking for. She wouldn't normally have suspected it to be something to do with the party pony's pinky sense, but the alternative was that Pinkie Pie might have a better grasp of the library's organization than Twilight, Spike, and Owlicious combined. Somehow, that was a more unsettling conclusion than Pinkie's sixth sense. Pinkie Pie cried triumphantly as she lifted an old dark book from one of the piles that were bound for the repair room. It didn't look like much or even as if it had anything to do with Nightmare Night. Instead of the mare and the moon, a crescent eye, or some other Nightmare Night symbol, there was only a wood cut of a few pieces of candy carved into the cover. Ye old tricks and treats. Wow, Pinkie, that book looks like it's seen better days. Twilight examined the book closely. It was hard to tell if it had been damaged in the fall from the shelves or if it had already been in such poor shape. You should put it back so Spike can fix it before it falls apart. Twilight's magic enveloped the book, but Pinkie Pie held onto it firmly. No, seriously, Twilight, the party pony urged. You and the girls should really read what this book has to say. There's more to Nightmare Night than just getting as much candy as possible. Pinkie looked shocked at her own words, but struggled all the harder against the pull of Twilight's magic. And this is me saying that! You know how much I love sweets! Let go, Pinkie! Twilight strained, her magic insufficient to shake off her friend's oddly adamant grasp. By now, Diamond Tiara and Silver Spoon had wandered away to make some other pony's life miserable, but the Cutie Mark Crusaders watched the struggle between Twilight and Pinkie Pie go back and forth. All three winced as a loud rip echoed throughout the library, and a cascade of book pages fluttered through the air. Between the two of them, Twilight and Pinkie managed to break the book's fragile spine, sending its delicate pages in all directions. 
Both ponies seemed shocked at what had happened. Uh... Started Apple Bloom. Well, just head on now, Pinky. I got chores and I need to get going back home. Yeah, and I promised Rainbow Dash I'd pick up her dry cleaning. Added Scootaloo as she nudged a distracted Sweetie Belle. Oh, oh, yeah, and I need to make sure that, uh... Rarity's order of new material for her Nightmare Night costume came in! Managed Sweetie Belle, her eyes glued firmly on the floor. The trio scurried away before what would surely be an explosive argument between the two friends, but Sweetie Belle hung back a moment. Her eyes had lit on a few of the pages that had fallen from the old tattered book. No pony was looking as she discreetly stuffed the pages into her school bag and trotted quickly after her friends.